Hi, my name is Rochelle Harding, and I am the program manager for the Home Garden Program at Valley Verde. And uh, welcome back to another uh, lesson here for June. We are talking about uh, being water wise. Uh, this is especially appropriate considering we've had temperatures in the hundreds this past week. Um, and some of us have just gotten our seedlings uh, into the garden beds. And so it's, uh, we're really looking forward to talking about water with you and how to conserve and um, as well as uh, water for your health, for your own physical health. So let's move forward here. Okay, so uh, this month we are going to uh, quickly review some of the things we learned about um, in May. So our brief May review, uh, we, for our nutrition and our health topic, we're gonna be, of course, talking about water. It's all about water this month. Uh, so for our garden topic, also uh, we'll be discussing how to water your garden, uh, how to adjust for temperature and um, just various factors that influence uh, how often you need to water your garden. Uh, we will be talking about uh, climate change uh, and water conservation. And then finally, we'll end with some announcements. Okay, so for our May review, um, back in May, uh, we talked about protein. Uh, so protein is essential to our diets as humans. Protein is made up of smaller units called amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids eight of which are considered to be essential amino acids, meaning we have to ingest them through our food because our body cannot make them on its own. So uh, we review um, of the complete and the incomplete uh, proteins. So as you can see over here, uh, this is a little visual image of a complete protein. So this is gonna be one of those eight um, essential uh, proteins, uh, these can be found in things like um, any dairy meat products. Um, and then our incomplete proteins are often uh, the vegetable proteins, but when you combine them together, they can form an, a complete protein, uh, which would be all eight of those essential ones. As long as we have the eight essential, our body can um, create the other 12. Uh, amino acids, but um, we must eat uh, and ingest the eight essential because our body can't make them on its own. So that's just a brief reminder and a visual here. Um, with the vegan protein combinations, we have, for example, our legumes, our chickpeas, our lentils, black beans, and then when in combination with things like nuts, cashews, almonds, or whole grains, it's going to go ahead and make a complete protein. So once again, very common staple, beans and rice, together they're a complete protein. And so you want to think when you're having vegetable protein, you want to think in combination um, of what goes well together and what's going to get you those eight essential amino acids. So additionally, uh, in May, we talked about garden pests and garden diseases. Uh, as you can see on the screen right here, this is a cucumber beetle. Uh, there's both the spotted, which is what this one is, and then there's the striped cucumber beetle, as well as many other predators uh, in your garden, aphids, um, the earwigs, uh, which some people call pincher beetle beetles because they have the, the pinchers on the end. Um, pill bugs, uh, other things that um, can cause damage uh, to your crops, grasshoppers, leafhoppers, those types of things. And then we also reviewed uh, diseases uh, that can happen in your garden. If uh, you're noticing spots like on this one down here, this was a bean leaf from my garden. And what I think happened here was a case of overwatering or watering in the evening. And then there was a warm evening the plant was wet because I watered too late in the day, and then um, a, a blight or fungal uh, spore, it's tiny, you can't even see it, blows in the air, and it found the perfect home on my bean plant, and it started uh, destroying the leaf here. And once it starts, it's really difficult to get under control. 
thankfully I had some neem oil and I mixed that together with a little soap and water combination, sprayed my plants down, pinched off at, uh, these diseased leaves, and I was able to get it under control, but mainly because I was really diligent and caught it early um, before it spread to the whole plant. So uh, keep in mind, um, watering is going to really impact um, your plant sus susceptibility to disease, uh, whether the leaves dry up and curl up, whether they wilt and you know turn yellow, all of that uh, is impacted by the water. So we'll learn more about that today. Um, if you need a review, if you're noticing uh, discoloration on your plants, uh, go ahead and review the May video because you're gonna uh, learn more in detail about diseases, pests, and some remedies of what you can do um, to treat those. Um, so uh, finally, we talked about our climate change topic was the carbon impact of our food. And so uh, the difference between the carbon impact of uh, animal products such as beef, lamb, uh, fish, uh, pork, chicken, cheese even, um, so byproducts of animals versus vegan or vegetarian uh, food-based proteins, um, so beans, tofu, um, that type of thing, nuts. Uh, so the carbon foot imp impact, which is like essentially all the emissions, the pollution that's created as a result of uh, the product that we're consuming, so either uh, meat, or dairy, or vegetables. Um, so what we learned was that the lowest impact beef, so you can see up here, low impact, so the very lowest beef product is going to have a greater impact on the environment than the highest vegetable impacts. So if these vegetable proteins were made in a factory that cared nothing about their carbon footprint, they are still going to produce less um, pollution to the environment than the lowest impact uh, beef farmer, so cattle farmer. So somebody, even a cattle farmer who's doing an incredible job um, to keep their carbon footprint low, it's still gonna have a very significant impact. So the solution that we proposed was trying the flexitarian diet. Um, this is, of course, as the name suggests, a flexible diet so that um, you eat less meat, um, which has uh, the greatest uh, negative impact um, when we eat meat. So if we eat less meat, uh, less frequently, then uh, increase our consumption of vegetables and vegetable proteins. Uh, we will really help the environment. We will help decrease the pollution that we're putting it into the air, which uh, co constitutes our carbon footprint. So um, as you can see, you know, it's not necessarily an all or nothing. If you wanna go vegetarian or vegan, that's wonderful. But if you're not able to do that, uh, whether you have cultural, traditions or different things um, where uh, sometimes, you know, having a meat product or an animal product um, is part of your celebration or just part of um, the food you enjoy. Uh, trying to limit that to be more of a treat rather than a regular thing is going to uh, make a big difference, uh, not only for the sustainability of um, our earth, but for the pollution that is created, the water that is used to raise uh, cattle is significantly higher than the water needed to grow a plant. So all of these things have an impact. And you know, as we've learned in previous months, we have limited resources on our planet. And when we are disconnected from our food source, um, we don't realize how our pollution is impacting it. We don't realize um, the conditions maybe that animals are in in order to feed us the quantities of beef and chicken and everything that we consume. And so um, the more we learn, the more we um, seek out information on these things, the more we realize um, 
that we have control over um, impacting our climate for better or for worse. And so we just encourage you to try the flexitarian diet where you primarily focus on vegetables uh, and vegan foods and um, then occasionally incorporate animal products into your diet as more of a treat. So you could think during the week, Monday through Friday, I'm gonna have you know, a vegetable-based diet, and then on the weekend, maybe I'll have my hamburger or whatever um, treat that you like to eat. Um, I love chicken tikka masala, or, um, you know, maybe it's ice cream or something. So we want to encourage uh, methods that are going to be sustainable and that aren't so difficult that people can't um, incorporate them into their lives. Okay, so moving on. Next slide. Okay, so back to our water topic for our nutrition and health. Um, we're going to talk about hydration and how much water uh, each person needs each day. So our bodies need water to function. In fact, 60% of our body's weight is water. Every organ and body system requires water to operate. Some of the ways our bodies use water include getting rid of waste through sweat, through urination, uh, using the bathroom, keeping our body temperature regulated, uh, lubricating and cushioning our joints uh, so that we can move and bend without pain, and then um, protecting sensitive tissues. So, you know, our eyes and, you know, mouth and everything, like water is um, in all of those organs and all of those um, parts of our body. So how much water we need depends on several factors. It's not the same for every person. So um, it, some of the factors that influence this would be how much we exercise. If we exercise a lot, then we're gonna need more water. If we're pretty sedentary, um, then we're gonna probably need a little less water. Um, most people probably do not drink enough water. Uh, so. Um, don't think that you can get away with just because you sit on the couch, you can, you know, only have one glass of water a day. You definitely need more than that. Um, but another factor that contributes is our environment. So um, living here in San Jose, um, it's been in the hundreds this week. Um, it's been hot. And, um, you know, if, it, if we were in a humid climate or, you know, an arid climate, that's going to require us to drink more water because we're going to sweat more. Um, and lose more water um, than if we were in a colder, cooler, more temperate climate. Um, additionally, our overall health impacts how much water we need. Um, certain diseases and conditions either uh, create greater thirst or um, create um, the need for us to drink more to flush out uh, toxins in our body. And then in addition, um, if uh, we are pregnant or breastfeeding, um, those are times of a woman's life where she needs even more water than usual because her body is working really hard to produce uh, a lot of important things for the baby. So, right. Okay. Uh, so on average, men should drink about 15 and a half cups of water per day. So that's 3.7 liters. And women should drink about 11 and a half cups or 2.7 liters of water per day. And just so you know, our bodies do get water through our food and our beverages. So we can count on maybe 20% of our water intake to come through our food. Just be sure that you are eating your vegetables and your fruits that contain, you know, the water. You know, you're gonna get water in like a cucumber or in, um, you know, fresh leafy greens that they contain water, but, um, you know, foods like a bread or pasta, that's not going to contain water. So, um, so about 20% of your food, mostly coming from fruit and vegetables is going to give you some additional water there. So how do you tell if you're hydrated? Um, there's some simple ways. And as you can see here on uh, the screen, we have this, how hydrated are you? chart. Now, if you, you know you're very well hydrated, if you go to the bathroom and your urine is either clear or really pale yellow, this is the goal right up here. 
I tell my kids this, <laughs> you know, that it needs to be light. If it's, if it's a darker um, kind of golden or amber color, you really need to drink water. Um, this suggests a glass of water, maybe even two. Um, now, if you ever get down here, this is kind of more of a medical emergency, I would say, um, and uh, you are severely dehydrated or you have something uh, affecting your kidneys, which is uh, not allowing your uh, body to filter the urine and get the toxins out. Um, and so that I would definitely call your doctor if you ever had urine that was this dark of brown. Um, but this is kind of just a basic gauge to know to check in throughout the day, like, first of all, how often am I needing to go to the bathroom? And if it's once a day, then you probably need to drink more water and it's probably gonna be, you know, one of these darker colors down here. Um, once again, this is the goal. You're well hydrated right up here. Um, so some other ways that you can tell that you're hydrated is if you don't feel thirsty. Um, now, one thing to remember, and I find this especially true with my children, is that um, oftentimes they think they're hungry when really their body is thirsty. Uh, so before giving a snack or before eating, um, I suggest drinking a full glass of water and uh, maybe waiting 15 minutes to see, are they still hungry or was their body just telling them that they were thirsty? Sometimes even in adults, um, we mistake thirst for hunger. So always be sure to drink that water first. It's going to help you with, um, you know, weight control as well, because uh, you'll feel less hungry if you're drinking water before you snack on anything. Um, so once again, your urine is very light, yellow or clear, and, uh, you know, drinking water at each meal, um, and then maybe once or twice as a snack when you wake up in the morning is a really great way to kind of get your organs moving and functioning um, as you're waking up uh, before bed it can um, depending on your health situation before bed it can help um, you relax especially if you take a bath um, if you take, drink a glass of water before your bath that will help you not to lose water from uh, sweat or evaporation uh, if you take evening showers or baths um, but um, obviously, if you wake up a lot during the night, then it's okay to, um, you know, maybe hold off that once it gets to like eight or nine o'clock, you know, no more water, that type of thing, depending on your bedtime or your children. So, so our monthly recipe uh, this month is infused water. I know that a lot of people don't love the taste of water. Uh, my sister is really bad about drinking water. She's gotten better, but um, she really likes the um, kind of the seltzer flavored waters, uh, which are great, and those work well too, but you can also do a homemade version. Um, some of the combinations listed here are um, pretty common, uh, well-liked flavors. Um, so all you have to do is just pinch off, like say some mint leaves from your garden. There's some limes up here um, and just create a combination. It could be, um, you know, oranges and mint. It could be all citrus. So like orange and lemon together. Um, limes, uh, it could be peach, plum, mint. There's some really great ideas and recipes out there. Um, and not only, you know, if you squeeze the fruit um, when you put it in, you're really going to get uh, the vitamins and minerals from the fruit uh, juices as well as the benefit of the hydration um, of drinking the water. So make sure, especially on these hot days, that you're um, drinking plenty of water. Um, the eight cups a day, which has been the average of what they, you know, common um, knowledge of what they recommend is good, but some people do need more than that. So it really depends on your size, your weight, your activity levels. So um, stay hydrated is the main goal. All right. And then we have some directions down here, how to infuse your water. So if you're leaving it at room temperature, it's gonna um, uh, be ready sooner. You want to give it time for the flavors to really absorb and mix and um, uh, dis um, disseminate into the water so it's really flavorful. 
Um, but if you put it in the refrigerator to keep it chilled, then you're gonna wanna wait a little longer because it takes, the process will take a little longer that way. Okay, so moving on to our garden topic. So um, adequate water is essential to the growth of your new plants. Many problems can arise when watering is done too frequently or not frequently enough. Things like blossom end rot, molds, fungus, slugs and snails are all attributed to excessive water. Likewise, splitting fruit, so when your tomatoes um, crack and split open, uh, that can occur when a plant is underwatered and then suddenly given excess water. So like you're gone on vacation for a few days and you forgot to water your garden or have a neighbor come and water. And then so you give it this huge big drink when you get home and water it really heavily. It might cause any tomatoes or fruit to split open because um, it went from very minimal water to excessive water. Um, so that can not give the plant time to expand properly uh, or the fruit of the plant. Um, okay, so in addition, water can be wasted depending on the method of watering and the time of day. Uh, so below, um, or the following are some important tips to keep in mind when watering your garden. So important uh, to water on a schedule. So when your plants are young, they may need water daily. However, once they're established, every other day is adequate. We suggest watering on the same days each week. For example, you could water Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then maybe a weekend day if needed. You can check the soil. Or you could do uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, but just make sure it's consistent. Uh, your plants are gonna really um, prefer and grow better when the, the watering schedule isn't totally sporadic, like several days in a row and then several days of not watering and then watering every other day, that's, that's really not helpful for the way the plant is growing. Apologies, I have a mockingbird singing to me right now. <laughs> um, so if it rains, and it's a, not just a light sprinkle, but if it's a good, you know, heavy rain, then delay watering and wait until the next day. Check the soil. Um, in the gardening tips videos, I have a short clip on how to check uh, the water in your soil. Essentially, you're just gonna stick your finger down a couple inches and feel around. If, if the soil is wet at the, you know, three or four inches down, then you know you water deep enough. But if it's not, then you need to water a little bit longer. Some people will water for 10 minutes and think they got it, but then only realize the water went an inch deep into their soil. And a lot of that depends on the type of soil you have, um, the drainage um, ability of the soil. So like a heavy clay soil is going to take longer to absorb the water. And if it's hot day, so if you water at noon or one o'clock, it's gonna evaporate a bunch of that water. So you're wasting water. Your plants don't have time to drink it up. Um, it's just getting evaporated. So you really wanna water in the morning. That is the best time of day to water because um, it, your plants will have time to drink up the water uh, through the roots and um, not have it evaporate with the heat of the sun. And then the benefit of not watering in the evening is that uh, slugs and snails like to come out at night and they, because it's cooler, and they like wet, warm environments. And so if you have your plants and the area is all wet, that's gonna attract the snails and slugs to chew up your garden while you're sleeping. So we don't want that. Um, so those are just some watering tips to be aware of. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so one another th cool thing that I found is that you can, um, invest for only like $10. Uh, they have them at Home Depot, but a soil water meter, which some of them are three part and they also will test pH and sunlight and um, the moisture, so how much water. So it's just a simple uh, tool that has these long metal prongs on it and you stick it into the soil and there's a little dial that will tell you if it, the soil is really dry, if it's too wet. And so you can kind of tell that way. 
Um, of course, once again, just the finger method of sticking your finger in the ground before you water, checking is really good because um, sometimes the it might feel like it's a nice sunny day, but your soil didn't dry out from the previous day. Um, so you really want to check because uh, like we learned about last month, there are a lot of diseases that can happen with plants when they're um, just sitting in water because the, the roots can't get oxygen when they're surrounded in water. Um, okay, so some other ways um, or tips, pinch off any damaged leaves that show signs of mold or disease so that it doesn't spread to the rest of the plant. As I mentioned earlier with uh, my bean plant, I was able to stop the uh, progression of the, the blight mold or fungus um, on the leaves because I pinched off, put, pinched them off and then sprayed the neem oil mixture. Um, I put this um, diagram on here for a second month um, in a row because I really feel like it's helpful to see what an underwatered plant looks like. The leaves are drooping, they're, they're hanging down and they might be turning yellow. A healthy plant is gonna have a little bit of a mixture of both, but mostly the leaves will be reaching up to the sun, uh, healthy, they're not wilting. Um, and then you can actually tell an overwatered plant, notice how the ends are dried up and turning black. This actually happened to a plant of mine uh, that I have in the kitchen window, it's an orchid. Um, and I thought it was getting burned from the sun, but it's actually because of the pattern of the um, dying away at the ends of the plant, it's, it's a lack of oxygen um, reaching the leaves because the roots were too inundated in water. And of course, orchids are very uh, finicky, difficult plants anyway. Um, but I thought that this visual was super helpful. So once again, pick a, a regular schedule uh, to water your plants. Uh, be sure to check the soil with your finger uh, to make sure that um, your soil is in need of water, um, or if you need to wait, you will know. So finally, um, moving on to our climate change topic, um, we are gonna talk about some water conservation. Um, this water conservation includes the practices and methods of regulating the consumption of a vital but limited resource, fresh water. So we're gonna go ahead and look at the graphics on the slide right over here, okay. Um, according to the sources, only 4% of the Earth's water is fresh water. And of that 4%, only 1% of the Earth's water is drinkable. So here we've got, this is all representative of all the water in the, in the Earth, or on the Earth, and most of it is gonna be our salt water, okay? And then a small percentage is fresh water right here, and then an even tinier sliver, this blue, is drinkable water. So when you look at the chart and see it in that light, it makes water conservation all the more important. Um, you know, many of us have access to running tap water that is drinkable, and that is not the case in many parts of the world. Um, and, you know, it also, will end up running out if we are not changing our habits and our ways. Uh, you know, here in California, um, the last six uh, or seven years or so, um, California experienced a five-year drought and um, people had to really limit their water use. Um, I actually moved from another state where this wasn't a problem in the northern part of the United States. And um, I didn't really think about the time of day that I did my laundry or um, how long my showers were or anything like that. But when you live in a climate that um, is becoming more and more arid, uh, you really realize the impact. And also, you know, the more heavily populated the area the more our reservoirs here in California run out of water. Um, if there isn't a cold enough winter with enough precipitation, we don't get the snow in the mountains. Um, 
all of this has a ripple effect on our access to fresh water. And so doing our part to conserve it is really important. Um, so over on the right here, I have some more infographics of just why it's important to conserve water. So more and more uh, land is becoming arid. It's called desertification. And uh, this is the process where fertile, lush um, land loses water and turns slowly into a desert. Um, and so it's important to conserve water because we need to prepare for future droughts. We need to not be naive and assume that water is an unending resource for us, um, especially as global population increases uh, rapidly and um, you know, people are more disconnected from the impact of their choices um, and parts of the world overconsume while other parts of the world receive, you know, an inadequate share of the resource. So um, we really want to think about our children, our grandchildren, we want to think about our global neighbors and those um, who are significantly impacted by our choices. Uh, so we're preserving the environment. When we conserve water, there's more water for plants, for uh, the animals. Uh, we're all part of the ecosystem and need to take care of each other. Um, another practical reason to conserve water is to guard against rising costs and potential conflicts over water. Um, so um, depending on where you live in the world, um, people will fight over water because uh, water is essential for life, and if there's not enough for everyone, then it can cause conflicts. And so um, to reduce that um, uh, global issue, uh, we can do our part to conserve water. Uh, conserving water strengthens communities because it helps um, maintain equal access to resources. And then finally, you know, on these 106 degree days, um, with su using sustainable methods, um, we really uh, enjoy, you know, having water for recreational purposes. Um, and so, you know, in order for those to be able to stay, you know, whenever the pandemic shelter in place lifts here in San Jose, um, you know, when the pools open back up and everything, we wanna be able to have access to those. But if we aren't conserving water in our homes, in our gardens, then um, we're not gonna have those resources available to us. Um, so all connected. All right, so how to save water. Let's talk practical lessons here. All right, so. on in my notes. Okay. So gray water. Gray water um, is really interesting concept. It's one that um, I have just started using. Um, as you can see here, um, this is a rain barrel. This is actually at my house. Uh, we've been, we've got two of these and we collect the rain water and then we can either use a watering can um, to fill it up or we can um, just connect the hose directly. Uh, there really needs to be a difference in elevation from the rain barrel to where you're watering so that gravity can help move the water along. Um, and this was uh, just enough gravity so that I had a slow drip going into uh, my flower bed over here. Um, it did have to go up this little stone wall, so that was a little tricky, but you know, we can raise the level of the barrel to be up higher, and then that's going to be less of a problem. Um, so how gray water systems work. So did you know that water that you use for um, taking a bath or a shower or washing your clothes or doing the dishes can actually be reused uh, for landscaping for uh, your garden? Um, of course, if you're cleaning with chemicals and that type of thing, you don't want to put that on your vegetable garden plants, um, but it might be just fine for um, watering uh, your landscape if you have uh, a lawn. Uh, so 
With a simple gray water system, you can re reuse water and direct it to your garden or landscape. This will save you money and save the environment from water shortages due to excessive water use. In California, many as of us are familiar with water conservation due to the frequent periods of drought. This is not the case in many places in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, but no less important. All of us can do our part to conserve water, one of our most precious and essential natural resources. Rain barrels can be pricey um, between, I think it was between 80 and $100, uh, maybe a little bit more, um, but it will save you money on your water bill in the long term. Uh, these barrels are placed under your rain gutters and collect the runoff rain water. You can have a simple hose connecting to the bottom of the rain barrel that drains the water to your garden as needed. Uh, you can close the valve when it's raining and then open it on a warm day to water your plants. Rain barrels, are used, as I mentioned, use gravity to get the water flow to your garden, but they can also use a pump. So this uh, infographic here, this has a pump tank. So it's actually pumping the water and you don't need to rely on gravity. But even if you don't have this fancy of a system, a simple rain barrel um, is going to do the same thing um, for Actually, we have um, a handout that will be attached in your email for participants that shows you how to create a home um, gray water system. And it even has all the parts that you would need to use to create a really simple system um, that's gonna collect you know, water from your laundry machine or, um, and then redirect it outside to plants. Um, so if you're interested in actually implementing this, I would go ahead and take a look at this uh, resource. This is from Valley Water, um, so from the water company, and they have more information on their website if you're interested um, in, in implementing a gray water system. So another thing that we can do, especially here in San Jose, um, it's going to depend on your water company and the programs they have available. But um, in San Jose, peak water usage hours are from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. So during this time, the water company charges more for water used because there are more people home, more people wanting access to the water. So if you check with your water provider to see what the rates apply to your usage and for ways to conserve, water. Um, if you water your garden in the morning, you'll save yourself money on your water bill and avoid midday evaporation, allowing your plants to get the most water they can absorb. So moving on, let's look at some daily habits that we can do to save water. Okay. This over here. Okay, so first of all, you know, time your showers. If you have kids who, you know, want to spend 30 minutes playing in the shower, set a timer and keep them short, um, you know, maybe around 10 minutes max. Um, when you're soaping up, um, don't have the water just running and hitting the wall. It's just draining dollar bills, you can imagine, <laughs> you know. Um, turn off the water, soap up, and then turn it back on to rinse off. Um, you can also install a low flow shower head. Um, these are available, you know, Home Depot or different uh, hardware supply stores. And that's gonna save you money and also conserve water. You know, simple things when you're brushing your teeth, uh, turn the water off while you're brushing and then just turn it back on to rinse. Um, when you're shaving, so if you're, you know, a man shaving your face, um, or shaving your legs or whatever, um, you can use a bowl of water to dip your razor blade in instead of just letting the faucet run and run and run um, if you're using like a straight uh, edge razor um, on your face and just rinse it off. And then that's going to really save uh, water from just running while you're um, doing your grooming. Um, so you can use bath water to water indoor or outdoor plants, you know, just bring your watering can in, scoop up a bucket of water and water the indoor plants. Um, use the shortest settings on your dish and laundry uh, washers, so, um, or hand wash your dishes, like if you have it in a bucket, um, you do your soapy dishes, scrub them all up, put them in another bucket that has maybe a clear rinse water, and then maybe do one final rinse with the tap. Um, but that way it's just not a constant running of water. 
uh, some of these things sound obvious, but uh, maybe we were never taught that they were important. And so, um, so I just encourage you to make these little lifestyle changes that are gonna make a big difference. Um, and uh, please, please do not buy bottled water. Uh, the processing and packaging of bottled water creates immense waste globally. And a simple home filtration system and reusable bottles are gonna save you money and help lower your carbon footprint. And then finally, um, fix leaks quickly. So if you have a garden hose like I did that um, got a hole in it recently, uh, we got some plumber's tape and taped it up and fixed it so that it's not leaking anymore because um, if water's just spraying onto the you know, sidewalk or cement, then it's not being used for any benefit and we're paying for it. And you know, it's one of that 1% of the world's water is just going to waste and being evaporated. So fix leaks, whether it's indoors, you know, your shower, if it's leaking, um, that can really add up, even if it's a slow drip. Uh, so I encourage you to get on top of any leaks. Um, and I just in closing like to uh, challenge you to uh, think of one way that you can commit to reducing your water consumption every day. So um, what can you do to help? One thing I did recently was install a super simple drip water system for my um, garden beds, my vegetable garden. And I'll do a separate video on that and how I installed it. And it uh, really requires just a hose, um, some um, plastic tubing, and depending on how big your garden is, maybe a pressure regulator, um, but it's a pretty simple setup. So um, what I like is that I can just turn it on. It um, doesn't waste water spraying the leaves, which they don't like that anyway. <laughs> um, keeps the water down at the roots and um, you know really helps to target you know water to the plants right exactly where they are so anyway um, thank you for listening um, to our June lesson I'm gonna close us off here with a few announcements um, so we had our seedling giveaways in earlier this month we had two giveaways we were able to give plants uh, to 1,300 families in Santa Clara County. And this represents around 5,600 plants, uh, seedlings, vegetable seedlings that we gave away. Um, and uh, we were just really thankful that we had the opportunity. We partnered with several local farms and organizations who donated seedlings. Um, and so we just want to say thank you to those partners. Um, if you received plants, uh, we'd love for you to text us at this um, number and send us your name, how you heard about us, and attach a photo of your new garden. We would love to see how they're doing, um, answer any questions that you have. So uh, please take a few minutes to uh, go snap a picture and send it to us. We'd really appreciate it. Um, program participants, be sure to text or email your program coordinator uh, to tell them that you've watched the June video. And we'll be sending out a three question survey just to uh, make sure that uh, you're watching and understanding the content in these videos. Uh, so please look for that and return those. That will be your monthly attendance. Um, and finally, please share our work uh, with your neighbors. We'll be recruiting for next year. Um, and we want to serve more people in need, low income uh, in Santa Clara County and help create better food access with culturally uh, preferred vegetables. Uh, that's, that's our mission and our goal. So thank you for listening and take care.